Good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Wilkes, and I'm a security architect for Palo Alto Networks. And I'm here to talk to you today about automation to prevent internet exposures becoming incidents. This is a presentation that I did earlier this year for the Network and Distribu Distributed System Security Symposium, also called NDSS. And if you're not familiar with that conference, it's more of an academic conference. So I'm not here to, to sell Palo Alto products, uh, but I'm here to definitely talk about how we automate and really, uh, you know, maybe spark some conversation, spark some thought about um, how you can do some of your automating, especially those internet exposures, a little bit better. So a little bit about me is, uh, first of all, that's my dog. His name is Belly Button. He's uh, cute, but he tries to eat everything. And uh, so I started my IT career in desktop support and later became a networking engineer. And it was very apparent that uh, automation was needed for all these jobs, whether it was deploying software to a thousand PCs or setting up enterprise networks or large cloud environments. Um, I've been coming to this meeting about 2018-ish. Um, I remember when it was in person, we had pizza. It, it was great. So definitely thanks, uh, Judy. Thanks, Nick. And even though Drew's not here, if he watches the recording, thanks a lot, Drew. I remember those early conversations, uh, you know, about, you know, different topics uh, like Kubernetes, containers, serverless, pipelines, Golang. It was so much information at once and it, it, was, it was overwhelming sometimes. But, uh, you know, I definitely took what I could and, and learned, learned as I could. And I've been doing, you know, a lot of network and security automation uh, recently. And security automation has been, you know, an awesome place to make a difference, you know, because the bad guys, they're using automation too. So we need to fight fire with fire. Um, and so if anyone's new to DevOps, new to automation, new to this meetup, I just want to say like, you're in the right place. You know, um, if, if you're, you know, confused, if you feel like asking some questions that you might think are, you know, um, not relevant or, you know, silly questions, just go ahead and ask them. You know, for me, I had to focus on some very simple use cases in the beginning. And one of the ones I remember from my last job is uh, I was working for a company that used load balancers and they were doing geolocation on the load balancers because they're were, they were a property uh, selling company. So a user would go on the website and if they're in Baltimore, bring up properties in Baltimore. And if the uh, geolocation was off, you know, that database was off, you, you would have a user in Baltimore get on the website and it would show properties for like San Francisco or Chicago, and it was a bad user experience. So I remember what we set up for that was we did Azure DevOps, you know, builds running regularly, kind of like a cron job, Python to reach out to the uh, uh, data, the geolocation uh, vendor, which is called Digital Element. If there was an update, put that in JFrog Artifactory and also send the JIRA ticket to networking team to go ahead and, and run separate automations to actually do the update. So really just when I would just focus on a simple use case like that, focus on automating every single part and then putting it together and making it better. That's For me, that's what DevOps is. But now I want to get into the actual presentation. And uh, I'm going to start with the story of Bob, the sysadmin. I can relate a lot to Bob because I've had a job like this before, you know, being a, being a sysadmin, and it, it's not easy. Um, maybe you can relate as well. In this case, in this story, rather, Bob made a huge mistake that he was setting up a server in the cloud, a Windows server, and he acts or he left the remote desktop protocol open to the internet. So remote desktop protocol, also called RDP, if you're not aware, is the uh, management uh, protocol for connecting to a Windows server. Maybe this was accident. Maybe you thought, oh, it's just temporarily, um, or it's just a dev environment, or if it was that bad, IT security would prevent me from doing this. Either way, an attacker was able to scan, find this exposure in as little as 15 minutes, and take advantage of it. And the next day, Bob comes in and he sees this on his screen. And this is something you never want to see because it means that you're in the midst of a ransomware attack, which mean, could mean that uh, you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage to your company, as well as possible front page news. So you might think that this is just a story, but it happens way more than you would think. As I mentioned, there's 
thousands of militia scanners out there. They're seeing when a CVE has come out and able to scan and find it within minutes. Um, a lot of times they're gonna store that information and sell on the dark web or someone who wants to pinpoint your organization. And we've seen RDP, the amount of RDP out there open the internet blow up in the last few years. A lot of this has to do with remote work and cloud. On average, RDP is exposed to internet over seven days, which is a huge amount of time because it only takes a fraction of that to take advantage of it. And here we see 20% of ransomware incidents started off as brute force attack. Uh, we've seen actually 50% of successful ransomware incidents see RDP as initial attack vector. So really what I wanna mention here is that a lot of organizations are focusing on automating the incidents to the point where it becomes ransomware. And if you're doing that, you're not in a good place because you're just, you're just playing catch up. Less organizations are actually automating internet exposures, but that's really important. So what I would say is a game plan to do that should be to determine what the exposures are, collect information on the affected assets, and then shut down the exposures fast and the minimal disruption. To do that, one thing you need to do is figure out your attack surface, which is you know, what parts of your organization are open to the internet. And this used to be super simple with on-premise networks, but it's gotten more complicated with cloud, shadow IT, internet of things, mobile, bring your own device, um, or even mergers and acquisitions. Maybe your company is buying other companies, you have to bring multiple companies together with different security postures. These can all be huge challenges. So really what your organization needs is some type of system out there that you can give some key data, maybe your public IP space, maybe some of your <clears throat> key domains. And uh, from there, it's able to pivot and find out what certificates you have and what are cloud resources. It's able to find out what services live on those assets. For instance, IP can be a web server, a piece of networking gear, a building control system or something else. And the risks that are involved with those services. Uh, we already mentioned RDP as a common ransomware vector, but maybe there's other critical vulnerabilities out there like insecure SSL ciphers, or maybe you have a piece of software like Apache that's not up to date, and that's a, a risk as well. Really just want to talk about this whole, this whole system here that's going out, scanning, scanning your attack service and generating alerts based on what your risks are, typically called your external attack service management solution. Now the automation to actually go out there and, and remediate your exposures is gonna to have to communicate with the other components of your network. One of them is the IT asset management system, which is a system to keep track of all your, you know, IT systems, which could be networking gear, physical servers, cloud servers, workstations. And it's gonna be really important for this automation to determine who manages a particular asset so you can reach out and notify them. Vulnerability management systems are similar to attack service management, but doing more scanning from the inside out and of a, a known list of assets rather than doing discovery and often more invasive scans like credentialed or exploitative. Uh, it's gonna be important for automation to reach out to this system as well because they have information on assets and also potential ownership information as well. Cloud service providers typically have some great APIs to pull information on the asset. You can also pull tags from an asset to help determine what environment the asset belongs to. And if you can't find ownership information from an API, you can often look at audit logs as well. So some challenges for doing this actual automation. The first one is unknown ownership. Asset management is a challenge for a lot of organizations because it's hard to keep up with these rapidly changing environments. And without 100% accurate asset management, you don't have clear ownership, and ownership is really gonna be important to get the right people involved, to notify them of the exposure, and, and a lot of times have them fix it. A lot of organizations also don't have clear application dependency diagrams, and this can be uh, a challenge too, because you don't know if the asset is production, development, both, something in the middle. No one wants to you know, break anything and get yelled at, or or even worse, lead to loss of revenue. So it's gonna be really important to, you know, uh, to find the business impact, to have trust in the automation and make sure it's not breaking stuff. Uh, lack of resources can also be a challenge that we found that many exploited exposures are actually known as much as 90%. This can be an issue of risk prioritization, resources, or the expertise to actually remediate. 
There's a huge imbalance out there that we found that takes seconds for attackers to scan for vulnerabilities, while organizations take days to determine the issue and actually remediate. So I just wanted to go over the flow of potential automation to eliminate the RDP exposure within the cloud. So first thing is you're gonna have your attack service management system actually do those global scans of your IP uh, space, your public IP space, find that RDP is exposed on a particular IP and generate alert. From that alert, the automation can be triggered. A lot of times you wanna do um, additional scan to make sure that this issue is still present. A lot of times people turn RDP on and off. You want the automation to reach out to third-party systems like the IT asset management and vulnerability management systems to help determine potential service owners and also reach out to the cloud service provider to pull information on tags, which can be helpful to determine what environment that asset's in. You can also notify the service owners. This can be through an email, ticketing system, or chat. Uh, a lot of times this is to tell them what the exposure is, and there are certain cases where the InfoSec team doesn't have the ability to make the change to, to repair the remediation. So you actually have to rely on the service owner to do so. Um, a lot of times you want the, you know, especially in the beginning process of this automation, we want analysts to be involved for every alert to um, double check to make sure that the, uh, the service owner was found correctly and that the environment was categorized correctly as well. But as there's some trust in the automation, they can be less and less involved and really focus on the more important alerts out there. A lot of cloud service providers have great security um, APIs for stuff like firewalls, in which case the automation can create some firewall rules. Uh, RDP is typically runs on TCP 3389. So what you could do is have one rule that allows uh, that TCP 3389 for all private IP ranges. That way, if there's a bastion host or VPN connection, connection um, administrators can still connect in to, to, to maintain the asset, the server. Um, and then the next rule would be a block for all uh, internet access. That way you're closing up the actual exposure. Next, you'd have a second scan that's gonna validate to make sure that this issue has actually been fixed. This can be really important in the case that you're having another party like the actual service owner make a change to make sure that they actually you know, resolve the issue. And then a summary can be generated um, a little report that could be used for documentation or could be emailed to the service owner. So this system is how you could use automation to prevent the situation that we saw in the beginning of this presentation with Bob. We talked about the challenges, here are some potential solutions. Uh, ownership can still be a challenge, but it, a lot of times APIs, the cloud service provider, asset management system can find the owner. If they can't, you can also have the automation prompt the vulnerability analyst and tell them to do some further investigation. Once they're done with their investigation, you can actually do another API call to update the, the remote system so that next time there's an alert on that asset, there's less um, discovery involved. We can do some pattern matching on host names to determine if a asset is uh, a development in a development environment or not. We can do the same with tags for the cloud service provider to help determine that. This is a great opportunity for machine learning to you know, look at patterns of what you know, matches development or not. And having this you know, trust in the automation is gonna be really important to make sure it isn't breaking those production workloads. So automation can be used to automatically mediate, again, if there's enough trust. The hope is that problems in the lower environments like a dev environment don't make it up to prod environments and that more alerts are closed out with automation and less with analyst intervention as time goes on. Some open questions or you know, food for thought. First one is you know, zero day vulnerability is always a challenge to detect. There also can be a challenge to remediate as well, especially if they require unique remediations. Testing remediations can also be a challenge, also in a way that you're doing it with smallest blast radius. This can be because a lot of organizations don't have development environments for their security tools. For instance, dev environments of Active Directory and endpoint solutions are, are less common. And really it's gonna be important to find that sweet spot of how much to involve analysts. So in the beginning of the process, a lot of times they might be clicking on every single alert 
But as the process goes on, you really want them, you know, trusting the automation and really focusing on the most critical alerts. So I want to thank you for taking part in this presentation and yeah, let me know if you have any questions. All right, I don't, don't see any um, questions in the chat. Yeah, I guess I can uh, just. That was, that was good. That was interesting, though. You covered it all quick. Awesome. So, yeah, I'm just going to jump into the demo and, and then we'll have another chance for questions later on as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I talked about I'm not trying to sell Palo Alto products, but I just wanted to go over some of what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at a few different GUIs, so I want to make sure it's not confusing. Right. Um, in Palo Alto Networks, we have a line of products called Cortex, and the idea behind it is, is protecting the future. So that's going to be a lot of the automation, devops stuff, stuff, um, security operations stuff. So the first product we have all the way on the left is, um, is our SOAR product, is security orchestration automation response. And for Cortex, as you can see, we add an X to the beginning of all these names. Um, so that's called XOR. XOR is, you know, again, our SOAR product. It's used for uh, SecOps automation, and um, it can be a standalone product, but I'm going to talk about, and we're going to see it kind of built into these other products. The second product is one I work with the most called Expanse, and that's going to be the actual ASM product that's going out there, scanning your uh, IPv4 public address range, doing a lot of discovery, um, finding your exposures. And then now with XOR and the back end, we're able to do automation to pull additional information and actually remediate. And we'll see that. And then I also want to bring up the one all the way on the right. It's called XIM, which is Extended Security Intelligence Automation Management. This is your all in one security operations tool. And we're going to mostly be actually focusing in this interface. Um, so not only does it have the ASM capability of Expanse and the automation capability of XOR, but it can also be a full-on SIM replacement tool as well. So um, because it has all the, the bells and whistles, again, that's why we're going to be in that interface the most. So first thing I want to mention is that for these products, we actually have uh, something called, we have Marketplace and we have the concept of content hacks. So these are going to be bundles of automations put together and we'll actually look into one. Um, so we know that organizations are going to use like cloud service providers, they're going to use multiple security tools, they're going to have active directory, all kinds of stuff. They're going to have ticketing system, you know, instant messaging system. So these, this is the, you know, components that you can download and have this out of the box. So you're not having to have to figure out, you know, API calls for AWS and Azure and GCP and the list goes on. A lot of it's already built out. And again, we have a lot of this content here. You can see all this AWS stuff. We're going to look into EC2 a little bit later on. We got a lot of Azure stuff here too. If, if you're an Azure fan and uh, GCP is a little bit split up uh, with, between the code name GCP or Google, but we have GCP as well. Or maybe, you know, because this is DevOps, maybe you really like Ansible. We have, you know, a content pack for Ansible Kubernetes, content pack for Ansible Linux. So we got a lot of, you know, content out there so you can just download this and, and run with a lot of it. Um, so it's really cool. And where this is actually stored is a public uh, Git repo. Um, Demisto is actually the old name for XOR. Um, so if you ever go to GitHub Demisto content, you can see a lot of this stuff in here under packs. So these are all those content packs. Now, if I go into the XIM interface, you know, I, I mentioned that I was gonna be here a lot. If you click on marketplace, you can actually look at more information for one of these. So we're going to do EC2 because I'm assuming maybe we have some AWS fans in the crowd. Maybe, maybe not. I like AWS anyway. So if you look at this uh, content pack, you know, we it talks about, you know, kind of what its main purpose is and what it can do. Um, you can look into version history to see what's been updated. 
there might be some dependencies, other content packs where it's, you know, using some information. And then content's gonna be at the actual automation content. And we'll go over these different parts. So this first one is integration, which integration is gonna be, um, you know, code to do API, external API calls, mostly with credentials. We see, you know, here we have an access key and a secret key that's been, you know, obfuscated. Um, we're setting up a default region there as well. And there's some uh, commands, or there's a lot of commands here actually. And each of these can be used to either pull data or change something in the cloud as well. Typically these integrations are gonna be either to pull information to you know, create an alert in, in the system to enrich data and get additional information. It can be used for the actual remediation or it could be used for something like uh, messaging as well, like sending an email, creating a ticket in the third party system or you know, a messaging um, service as well. This is a good example here that we'll look at later, AWS EC2 describe instances. Um, so, you know, this is a command that I'll show you how to run later on the pull information on an EC2 instance. If you want to look at the actual code, you can click up here. This is actually going to be Python. Most of these integrations are going to be Python based, but there are some that are PowerShell. There are some that are JavaScript. Um, and you can, in this a uh, GUI interface, you can look at some of the pr parameters for setting up this integration, like the default region. If you want to look at the actual commands, like that AWS EC2 describe instances, you can see the actual arguments here and also where it outputs. And we'll go over how this looks like um, later on as well. We also see that this is actually going to be running on a Docker container. So what's going to happen in the system is that when it, when you run a command, it's going to spin up a Docker made it, Docker container, run the command, and then you know after it's outputted, shut it down. Um, so yeah, that is integrations. We also have scripts, which are also called automations. And really, this is going to be very similar to integration. The, the main difference is that it's not going to be using a credentialed API call. This is more to put together multiple integration commands or just to, you know, edit data, do some slicing and dicing. This one looks like you give some information and actually finds what parts of a security group are over permissive that are allowing internet access, which is pretty important. So you're giving it these arguments, and um, this is where it's outputting. Again, uh, you know, this is running on a Docker container as well. And these are typically Python, but they can be, you know, PowerShell or JavaScript. And putting those automation pieces together, we have what's called a playbook, uh, which is going to be a visual representation of putting different pieces of automation together. So in this, in this playbook, you typically, you know, each task is going to be a um, Either integration command or an or one of those scripts. Um, in this case, this playbook looks like it's going to add a bunch of IPs to an AWS security group. Um, you also have conditional tasks like this one. This is an if then statement, effectively, um, that's saying, "Hey, if you have this integration configured, go ahead and go on to this next step." This next step is, you know, going to describe get collect information on a security group based on some parameters, and then it'll go on and on and on. If for some reason you didn't have it enabled, it would go to the end of this playbook and, and, and close out. But you can do some really cool stuff in here. Um, in playbooks, you can have a playbook inside of a playbook called a sub playbook. You can do looping. And really just, uh, you know, if, if you're less familiar with programming, this is a great way to get involved and kind of see the visual flow of it. Um, which actually, what I wanted to do is actually show how to build a, a very simple uh, playbook. And before I do that, I actually want to show um, an alert. So this is going to be alert that's, you know, it's going to be one of those exposure alerts that we're seeing RDP on this IP. Really what I wanted to show in this alert is that when the alert's created, it's actually going to have this JSON blob over here, which looks fancy, looks nice and neat or at least for a JSON blob. But this is going to be some information that you start to alert off with that you can key off in the playbook and use as inputs to collect additional information. 
So for instance, we're able to see that this is the RDP alert. Uh, there's some GUIDs for like the service ID. You could use other IPs to get additional information. Um, yeah, the host name, that might be important. Um, really what I'm gonna show that we're gonna be keying off of is remote IP. You know, that we can, we're gonna search for a EC2 instance with the actual, you know, remote IP. So, cool. So when you're editing a playbook, you can, you have this task library. So if you don't really know what command you're looking for, you can kind of search and I can look at all the AWS commands here. Typically, you, I mean, you can also just kind of drag and drop. And so I just create a new task there. I'm going to do some copy and paste to make it a little bit easier to give it a name. And we're going to look for the AWS EC2 describe instances command. And then I know we have to add a filter. We're going to click on this to, to access the, you know, that, that context, the alert context we saw on the other screen. And I'll type in remote IP. And I know from experience that, uh, you know, you can't just give it the IP. You actually have to specify what type of, you know, what you're actually looking for. So I'm going to do this transform, which is a way to like add, you know, the IP to a string. So I'm going to do concat. I'm going to add this part, which name equals IP address values equals. So, and then it's going to have the IP address. So that's what it's going to look like. And then what I'm going to do is while I'm like testing this, I'm actually going to have it reference the alert context for that um, for that other alert we saw. So that way we have this context. We can key off that remote IP. I can do a search. We can see this IP here. And we can go ahead and click run. And we can kind of see a very simple playbook, you know, running. Cool. So this completed. Um, one of the things we'll see first is, you know, we'll have some very nice human readable stuff here. Like we have the image ID, instance ID. We have the, you know, the tags here. If you want to see what was actually input to command, you can see this. That's what that you know transform created. It added the IP to end, and that's what was used for this. If you want to look at like the raw JSON, you can do that as well. And on this right hand side, we'll see because that command ran, it actually created this part in context that it has all that same information under AWS EC2 instances. And that's going to be important because now that that information is in context, that means that we can key off of that and do other tasks. So what I'm gonna do is a little bit of copy and paste for sake of time. But what we're gonna do is a conditional task here. So what I'm gonna be looking for is, hey, does AWS EC2 instances, does that key, is that actually defined? So is it there? Really what that means is we're saying, hey, did this previous task work? Because we see here in outputs, that if it works, it should output to that key. If it did, we're going to go ahead and create a service now ticket. Um, if you're not familiar, short description is pretty much the title. And we're going to take the AWS instance ID and we're going to, you know, do a concat. So we're going to add AWS instance number and then needs attention, make the title. And then the description will just be alert details. So let's go ahead and run this. We can actually see it running a little bit. Yep. And looks like we're done there. So we can see this is like the ticket number. That's the system ID. You know, this is the description that gives some information and that's the title. So this is kind of a really easy example or a quick example of like kind of what you could do to create a ticket for to notify a service owner. You probably want to have a little bit more data in there, but you, you get the idea. And this actually created some new information in context as well. This serves now ticket and then ticket that you could key off of in other playbook tasks as well. If you wanted to force it to the side where you didn't find information because it's conditional, you can do that as well. 
I forgot to mention that the else statement, instead of creating a service now ticket, all it does is print. I didn't find AWS information. So yeah, that's the quick and dirty to like creating a very simple playbook. I'm guessing what you want to see is actually remediating because that's the cool part, right? You have a server in AWS here. It's, you can see I'm connected to it by RDP. That's not good to have a server in AWS open. You know, we saw what happened to Bob. We don't want that to happen to us. So at this point, what we'll do is we'll switch from this XIM interface and we'll go to the expanse interface, which is a little bit different. We'll have more information on these exposures. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's also running the automation in the, in the back end, but we really want to make it easier for like the vulnerability analyst to, you know, um, to, to get the job done by having a lot of like uh, a good a good interface and, and all the information in really one of these tabs here. So we see, you know, this is, you know, the same kind of exposure. It has some information on RDP, you know, information on when it was observed, the port, the certificate. This is what we call remediation guidance, which is really important. This is how you can actually remediate it. And this would be a good blurb to send to the service owner and tell them, hey, this is how you can go ahead and fix this. Um, if we look down, we can see information we collected from enrichment. It looks like these are some of the sys IDs. Um, these are tags. You know, one of them is my email address, and we have some private IPs as well. Now the analyst would look over that, kind of make some decision, maybe the um, you know, determine, hey, this is actual dev environment and we do want to remediate it. And they go ahead and click on this part that says automated remediation by restricting open ports. So I'll, I'll have that run because it's going to take a second. And uh, in the meantime, I uh, forgot to show my demo screen, which is my dog again, but it's never too late. Uh, here's belly button again. But uh, to show what we're actually doing in this remediation is we could, we could have just shut down the AWS EC2 instance, but that's really destructive. We could have applied a security group that's really restrictive not good as well. What we're doing is, is, I think is really cool, is we're gonna actually find out which, we're gonna find the security group, we're gonna go ahead and copy it, and then we're gonna remove the over permissive parts. So this is an example up here of a security group that is bad. You know, it's allowing all ports, not good at all, don't recommend it. But the automation is gonna copy it and remove the over permissive part. Remember, RDP is typically TCP 3389, so no longer will we have 3389 open to the internet, but we will have it open to private IP ranges. That way, if there's a bastion host, VPN connection, or um, direct connect, you know, administrators are still able to connect in, but every other port is still there. So business goes on as usual. And if we go ahead and look at our RDP at this point, well, if the demo gods are on my side, we'll see. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, let's see. Look down to just takes a minute. Um, Okay, so we see an error here in the actual playbook. Uh, let's see if I can just try to rerun this guy. Got some live troubleshooting. All right, well, um, yeah, so again, uh, should have closed that guy out. I'm not really sure what's going on. I guess the luck isn't 100% on my side today, but I could definitely look at it you know, later on. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you might also say like, hey, we don't want the analysts to go ahead and, and you, know, um, you know, click on it through every alert. That's a lot of work, especially if you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of expo exposures. So once you get, you know, some, uh, States in the actual automation. Um, what you can do is create what we have remediation path rules. Um, you know that you're you're telling it. You know, hey, if the tax service rules RDP and there's some criteria here, 
like one of them, maybe it's a severe or a critical alert, go ahead and do the automated remediation, right? Um, that's, uh, you know, or, or if you know that, hey, this is one that we always want to send the service now, take it or send an email, you can do that too. Um, also want to say about the, the automation too, is this, you know, in this situation not working, it's probably a good, good time to mention that that's why we want to do the follow-up scan after it's been remediated to make sure that it's 100% has been fixed, right? Um, you know, because a lot of times with these exposures, you know, companies don't know about them and they also might not know exactly the best way to, you know, uh, remediate them as well. Um, but regardless, uh, this is an example of a report that could be, you know, done as well or created that's going to have information on the service. It's going to have information on the asset as well. Um, the remediation taken in this place, a, you know, the service port was closed from the internet. Um, the service owner that was found, in this case, it's me. Uh, who clicked on that data collection pass, which was the, you know, the job, the, the buttons I clicked to actually do the remediation. We have the private IP addresses, some information on the cloud, some of the tags and uh, system identifiers. Um, so yeah, that's uh, about it on the presentation I have. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is that at Palo Alto Networks, we actually, you know, if you're interested in, in learning more about, you know, the automation, especially XOR, it looks like we still have a community edition that you can try this out for free. You install on your own Linux box and, uh, you know, uh, you know, you're able to try out, you know, de developing some of those integrations, automations and playbooks and, and, and check it out for free, which I would definitely recommend. Um, and with that all done, I'm, I'm back to questions if anyone has any. Appreciate it, John. Um, so. I, I have one question. Hey, is, is it pronounced Nader? Nader. 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 Go ahead, please. I agree with John. Really cool stuff. So uh, if a system has been compromised, this, this seems like uh, kind of shutting down the port and things like that, remediate that. But if a system has actually been compromised and you know somebody got into a system, can that be automated also with these tools? Yeah. Like if, if, like a virus, they install some kind of program on your uh, Windows server. How would you remedi remediate that? And how can you detect and remediate that? Absolutely. Um, so, so this brings back to you know the like the SOAR. Um, you know, we, you know, Palo Alto. We do have an endpoint solution. It's called XCR. So we're able to determine you know. Um, stuff like uh, a virus on a Windows server. And from that, it's able to generate alert. And from that alert, you know, you can run automations as you saw me do in a, in a playbook. Um, and typically for, you know, SOAR, the, the biggest use cases are gonna be endpoint and phishing, right? Um, in, the, in the case of like automations for endpoint, a lot of times, or, and for all these, you know, playbooks, it's gonna be to make sure that, you know, the alert isn't a false positive, um, but, you know, it's, it's really all you can do. It, it, it's how much confidence you have in the automation, how much you run it. You can have it that if, if you're for sure that it's a, a virus and it's going to spread that you can have it go ahead and shut down the server, you know, especially if it's a VM or in the cloud. And we do have playbooks that do that. Um, more, more likely though, you're going to have, you know, um, you know, look at some, um, indicators of compromise, like say, hey, this this is like a malicious file hash, or we're seeing this, you know, um, behavior, you know, uh, in in the system using the endpoint system, and we're able to pull that into the you know automation and determine, hey, this is bad. So let's increase the severity of this alert. And what you can have that do is you can have that trigger other automation. So that the you know, if automation is determining, hey, this isn't like a low, 
priority you know alert this is high or critical or even a breach you can have it automatically you know email people you can have automatically message people and then you can also have options in the in that interface where you know you can click on buttons that you know say shut down this server or you know we res reset this password you know um yeah the the sky is the limit right for that kind of stuff so uh let me know if i answered that question for you if you have other questions no that answers it sounds really cool and i like the part where you said you have you have playbooks for different scenarios uh that's that's pretty cool so you, can, you don't have to build it is that true like is that what i heard yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times you w might have to edit them to customize for your environment. But uh, yeah, we have a, a lot of playbooks that are already built for that kind of stuff. You know, um, one of the cool ones I like that, uh, you know, it's not necessarily related to internet exposures, but what I've used before is, you know, phishing is a big use case for security automation for, for XOR. Um, so, you know, there's actually a playbook that sounds really awesome. It's called uh, Search and Destroy. And what that does is once you found that it is an actual malicious you know, email, maybe it's some type of credential harvester or something like that. Um, a lot of times these fish senders are sending to multiple people in the organization. So what you can do is actually run this playbook that's looking for the same email, either the same subject, same sender or both. And it's able to go into all the mailboxes of your organization and go ahead and delete them so that other people aren't clicking on it by accident and and you know increasing the you know um the damage by that particular fish but uh yeah there's a lot of cool use cases with security automation Really nice presentation, man. I, I really enjoyed it. And I thought it was a nice balance of, um, you know, what we're trying to achieve from operational goals to uh, tech know-how. And it's it's cool that you guys have those Python libraries and it seems like it's a pretty straightforward process to go and explore on that. My question to you is, what are the issues with someone that's looking to do this DIY in their environment? What things would you say to worry about or avoid if you're starting to build an automation process like that? So uh, thanks, Chris. I, so are you trying to get into the whole build versus buy? Is that kind of what you're getting into? No, no, not necessarily. I guess I'm just saying like, you know, don't stand in a pool of water if you're going to re rewire your electrical box, right? I was just asking you like, what kinds of things do you think about if somebody's going to go in and use these automations and use the technologies that you describe? Are there, are there processes they should think about ahead of time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking like more specifics. A lot of times we do, you know, we recommend with our customers like use case development, you know, to focus on, you know, one of those use cases at a time. What's the most important one? Like, where are you? Um, what is the security operation? What is the SOC, you know, security operations center doing now? What is the huge time waste? And what, you know, what is some, you know, good ways that automation can help right away? Um, so a lot of times they'll be focusing on one of those use cases. And as I mentioned, you know, a lot of the big ones are, you know, phishing or, you know, endpoint, right? Um, but yeah, I would, I would say focus on one of those use cases and focus on how you can make it incrementally better. Like that's a DevOps philosophy is like a lot of times we have these huge like goals and we want to like fix everything and have like a machine and, you know, just, just, no more exposures, no more malware, no more, you know, it's a process, right? You know, and we're always going to need um, good people and security automation that are, you know, able to go in there and, you know, as you can see from my presentation, fix bugs, find out what's going wrong and, uh, you know, um, look for improvements. Um, and uh, it's going to be, a lot of organizations are going to have a different team that's doing the automation and a different team that's actually, you know, running through the playbooks or, or, or actually like the SOC analyst, right? Or the vulnerability analyst. So it's going to be important to get feedback and do some shadowing with them and see what they're doing 
Like a lot of times, maybe they're going to another system. Maybe they're opening up another window to pull up, you know, the AWS console or, you know, Azure Active Directory console. Like that can be a time waste in itself, like because you can pull that information into the, this, you know, in these X, the XOR product and have it displayed nice and neat with all different types of enrichments. So, um, yeah, I would try. So, in summary, like I would try to be focused with your efforts, right, um, and not try to boil the ocean, you know, and be realistic and and look at incremental changes, and then also try to get feedback as soon as possible. Those are probably the two big things. Great answer. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yep. No worries. Thanks for the question. Really appreciated this. Nick, if you want to um, turn the recording off, then we can ask questions that we might have been